Welcome to the NRC01PL Personal Learning MOOC Hangout for Tuesday on week four. And I'm going to be joined, hopefully, in just a few moments with Helene Fournier. She works here in Moncton, New Brunswick, which is where I am, although all you can see is a computer room behind me. I'm in a room called the ACE Room. It stands for Advanced Computing Environment. And it looks very nice. As you can see, we have a podium and flag and computer screens and, well, lights. You know, it's not your, your typical video conferencing kind of room. Not the greatest environment to have something like this. Uh, particularly with the uh, machines humming in the background there, uh, but it'll work. Uh, we're going to get Helen here any moment. I've sent her the invitation, and uh, so she tells me she has lots to say. If she doesn't make it in, we'll get her to come across the hall and sit her down right here, which is probably what we should have done to begin with, but, you know, sometimes... We don't think of these things ahead of time a whole lot. This week, the course is about personal learning environments. So we're moving from the discussion that we started last week on connectivist MOOCs. And Helen will have a fair bit to say about connectivist MOOCs. And we're moving into the discussion of personal learning environments specifically. Now, what Helen will be discussing is the research that was done when we ran you know, everything from the first CMOOC back in 2008 through a number of MOOCs that we ran through a personal learning environment project we ran internally here in Moncton and other MOOCs that we've done inside and outside the envelope of personal learning environments. So still waiting for her. I keep expecting her to pop through that door. While we're waiting for her, I'm going to uh, pop over to the NRC Twitter feed. So let's have a look at what we've got here in the NRC Twitter feed. What I mean is the, uh, the uh, tag NRC 01PL and let's just see if I can't share the screen here while I'm doing this. No, let's showcase screen share. So and we'll pop over to all right so now I'm inside inside my web browser having a look at what people have had to say so we've had, uh, again, a bunch of diagrams being created for the course. So this one here appears to be new-ish. Uh, no, that was made back in March 11. Now the problem with Twitter, problem with any of these things, of course, is we don't always get things in the order that we want. So let's hit view all. Oh, but that's going to make us view all the photos. So let's... Is there a way to view all only the tweets? There should be a way, but where's there's no link? Oh, maybe this no us. <laughs> so oh how annoying. Twitter, why do you do things like this to me? You have a view all up here for photos. I don't want photos, I want the tweets. Tweets, please, tweets, top live. Okay. All right, this must be it, I think. So, oh, sketch notes for week three are finished. So, this is again Raffalini Rosetta, sketch notes for week three. We certainly appreciate these uh, contributions. I think they're adding a lot to the course. Uh, Jupiter writes, great post which points to the benefits of online discussion, which I appreciate. So let's have a look at this great post. So this is from uh, the world, the greatest 
WordPress site in all the land. So, okay, so this is cool. Learning Loneliness, XMOOC Fun, MED Musings, and French Lit Loneliness. So, cool. <laughs> so, uh, I wish, oh, I don't have that, do I? So Netscape hasn't updated my uh, bookmarks toolbar. So it's because I'm using the version that's here in Moncton and not my normal desktop, right? So I don't have a, a quick way of popping that into the Dejo uh, uh, list of stuff to uh, add to the uh, blog. But okay, so that's cool. What else have we got here? I'm going to come back to that one. Um, Don Prezant is saying that uh, this idea of the badge is a boundary object moving across contexts and purposes, bringing and changing meaning, connecting people. He says he likes that. Here we have literally.wordpress.com, personal learning ecosystems as an internet of badge things. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. Let's check and see if Helen has joined us yet. Nope. So, <laughs> Helen, if you're watching, come on into the other room. Uh, I imagine what's happened is the same thing that happened to me, and the reason why or a wee bit late starting up is that uh, on a new machine, of course, when you're entering Google Hangout, Google wants to download and install the Google Talk plugin, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But it takes a few, well, not seconds, as the web page says, but a few minutes to do that. And so I'm guessing that that's what's happening right now. Uh, I'd love to just jump up and run into the other room, but you really can't do that when you're in the middle of a webcast. Let's uh, pop into the course itself. Open edX, lpss.me. So here we are again, view course. We'll hit the courseware have a look at what we're up to for this week because I haven't really summarized that yet but uh, and here she comes <laughs> so we'll do it there. you will do it here okay, okay. so Helen didn't Why succeed <laughs> in connecting over there so she'll connect here hello everyone <laughs> all right so yeah I, think, I believe we're not sharing anything Nope. Okay. So, okay. Cut on. <laughs> so, somewhere in the other room, Helen's computer is failing to load Hangout. Okay. This is Helen Fournier. Uh, she's worked with National Research Council how long? Since 2002. 2002. Yeah. So, 14 years 14 almost. 14 years. Yep. 14 frightening years. <laughs> uh, so with us here at National Research Council. So she's been working with us all the way through uh, the original Connectivism MOOC. She was around and lurking and doing research. The Personal Learning MOOC, Personal Learning Environment, uh, Networks and Knowledge MOOC, or PLANK. Uh, she was part of the Personal Learning Environment project that we did a few years back. And she's now part of the Learning and Performance Support Systems program that we have running now. Anything else I need to say about yeah. you? My background is actually in educational psychology. So I do the user end uh, type, uh, user studies type surveys, like to get in there and see what, how the uh, technology is actually impacting teaching and learning. Uh, but I surround myself well with uh, application specialists and philosophers and engineers and programmers. So they do the magic. I do the the, uh, the research part of it, so I'm well surrounded here at the National Research Council, and we collaborate a lot across sites. So uh, I have a chance to to work with uh, a lot of interesting people. Mm -hmm. We, when I'll get into that 
a little later about the pu publications and sure. our work that's uh, freely accessible and open to people who are actually doing research on this course and are participating. So, so why don't why don't you give us? Some, uh, we haven't rehearsed these questions at all. <laughs> <laughs> so on the fly. <laughs> she ha she has notes, but but I have none. Uh, so I'm making this up a little bit, uh, but that's okay. Um, so why don't you tell us a bit about what you've been doing with these other projects over the years? I know okay. you've worked with uh, Rita Kopp, and I know you've worked yes. with Guillaume yes. Durand and others. Yes. What exactly have you been doing? That's the reason I have notes, because uh, we've been busy since 2008. We've actually been doing, uh, conducting a lot of research around uh, MOOCs, and uh, it's been ongoing. We've done the personal learning environments, uh, started some of the earliest research around MOOCs, and actually evaluating what's going on in terms of the learning, the teaching, the facilitation, some of the issues and challenges earlier on are not necessarily what the issues and challenges are currently, mm -hmm. but we're spanning how many years now? My math is not good, six, seven years of research from the early beginning of uh, MOOCs. And you actually get credit for, for having coined, along with uh, Dave Cormier, the actual term MOOC. Um, and you've uh, added to the uh, connectivist uh, type MOOC, and I'll get into some, some yes. definitions later on. But we've identified along the years important gaps also mm -hmm. and around the types of support mechanisms and feedback that people require in an open type learning environment so just to mention a few themes that we've published on across the four MOOCs that I've actually done research on critical literacies MOOC the Planck personal learning environment and network learning MOOC mm -hmm. uh, clone we had uh, you had facilitated a French MOOC right. on open and educational uh, learning resources and this one as well, as some of the participants are well aware, there's research going on in the background here. We're surveying participants in the course, which is essential to the research I do. We right. have to get uh, participant feedback and comments, and that's where we get a lot of the rich data that we've been able to publish. Um, so you've asked, what what have we been up to? Well. Uh, we <laughs> we published a lot just from the list of publications that I can actually share with participants in this this course that are interested in what we publish. We published on emerging technologies, the influence of emerging technologies on design of uh, learning environments, uh, the role of educators and learners in these open, unstructured type uh, environments. Uh, we've published on the pedagogy of abundance. Uh, and to the type of pedagogy that supports humans uh, in human mediation in these type of, uh, of environment, in exchanging information, sharing information, uh, building connections, self-directed learning, serendipity, how you actually find interesting information, how you stumble across it, what do you do with it, how you share it with people in, a, in an open network type or participatory type environment like the MOOC. Um, social and affective issues we published on, educational data mining, we've done analytics. Uh, so we've so done a lot. I have a, a question for yes. you. So when people say, and I've seen this a lot, there's no research on MOOCs. Do you ever get frustrated? You've actually corrected that, I think, <laughs> in, in blogs and on comments on various sites that I've seen. Uh, we've actually been invited as experts mm -hmm. in the field, uh, and uh, we published on uh, a, a MOOC, uh, uh, MOOCs worldwide. So we've actually been solicited to contribute to to MOOC publications because mm -hmm. of our early research. So sure. we're recognized. Uh, but you get the word out there that we started some of the earliest research mm -hmm. on MOOCs at the NRC. So. We're, we're well published, we're visible out there. So uh, I think the publications speak for themselves and people can trace right. the timelines of when we actually yeah. started. And we pretty much started the research in parallel to the, the, the earliest MOOCs you offered. You surveyed people, you right. asked them, you know, what are the tools, what's effective, what are mm -hmm. we doing right, what are we doing wrong, what do we have to improve on? And we always accompanied your, your MOOCs with uh, a good healthy dose of user type and the surveys to get participants to actually tell us what we're doing right what we're doing not 
Not so good. Not so good yeah. and not so right. So I want to know. <laughs> and this might not be in order, but what were we doing right? <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'm going to start with. It's always interesting okay. to see in your MOOCs early on that the numbers were really high. Yeah. And uh, you're talking 900 plus participants. And in this current MOOC offering, we have 277 participants, which right. is a, a modest but manageable number mm -hmm. of participants. Uh, so we've conducted surveys, we've conducted uh, interviews, focus groups. Of course, it's easier to break people down into small groups and yeah. get their feedback. So you want to know specifically the demographics haven't uh, haven't changed that much. It fluctuates from you have a widespread uh, number of participants mm -hmm. from can we, can various, right? various contents. Is uh, that the demographics? Yep, from right. different continents. So Europe is always up there. Advanced graphics. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you see, I'll read it out. The uh, one of the lines is uh, the majority from Europe, and then North America always comes out as a second yeah. strongest. Uh, yeah. Number of participants. And this is one of the other moves, isn't it? The plank. That's the plank, and you. That's just to show the age groups. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, most of the time is uh, people aged 55 and mm -hmm. older. So we've seen that consistently through your yeah. moves that it's an, an older, uh, fairly uh, older uh, uh, demographic. And it's just what comes out in the research is because of availability. People yeah. uh, that are retired uh, or semi-retired going towards another career have a little bit more time to invest in a MOOC because yeah. we all we found out from the research as well. MOOCs are time consuming. You don't have to read everything. You don't have to know everything like you've yeah. always reinforced. But people want to survey. People want to read up. And it does take a fair amount of time. Yeah. The reasons for not uh, completing a MOOC or continuing on with a MOOC, uh, um, most of the times personal reasons, sickness, health, um, different priority shifts. And, and that's the reason why people have dropped off. So it's their fault, not our fault. Not <laughs> <laughs> Usually. That's one way to interpret the result. <laughs> So, uh, in terms of um, MOOC experiences, okay, what what have we, and you asked, what we're doing, right, right, yeah. they always find them interesting, but, there's always a but, challenging, okay, they've often been, mm -hmm. been described as chaotic, disorganized. Are we chaotic and disorganized? Ask yourself. <laughs> and this has yeah. this has come out uh, in the, the most recent survey as well, we had yeah. over 60 uh, uh, participants in your your personal learning MOOC uh, respond and again there are positive negatives we've received a lot of uh, interesting comments from people um, like again they comment on dropout rates already early in the course yeah. not that they're anticipating but they say mm -hmm. okay with the volume of what has to be read yeah. uh, there's good learning material but it is difficult to follow and keep up okay so that's one of the things. Mostly, some people are browser uh, browsers. They admit that they're just lurking. They're there out of interest. Um, again, a little lower, disorganized content. Well, mm -hmm. interaction bad. So interaction is a problem. Uh, That's if you yeah, it's it's always a challenge for people. If you're self-directed and you don't mind chaos, sifting through information, finding exactly what you need when you need it, is not problematic. For other people that are use to structured content, uh, a certain amount of facilitation, uh, yeah. guidance and support, uh, that becomes problematic because they're used to, you know, institutional higher education type, you know, formal yeah. education, traditional type uh, classroom setting where the teacher kind of spoon feeds you and tells yeah. you what you should do. Well, we're, we're pretty structured here. We have the week by week thing and that, that feels like spoon feeding to me. Maybe not so much. And we've noticed in some of the MOOCs that you did have that structure of weekly, okay, a yeah. visual of, of what's coming up or what they can expect week to week. It has improved yeah. uh, on the comments coming back, oh, yeah. uh, the negative aspects of, okay, at least now we see a structure. Okay. And there's a weekly uh, outline of what what we can expect going forward and right. how much reading to do. And yeah. in terms of the types of activities people can engage in, it's you know people will take the lead and and blog if they want to blog yeah. and we've had people come back and say okay i'm using tools and technologies that i haven't used before um so i'm out of my comfort zone basically but uh, people will go ahead and and experiment and do i think things. people are out of their comfort zone with the dj because i've noticed the the contributions have dropped off well completely okay, okay. so yeah, yeah. 
and Twitter feeds and yeah. but the other interesting thing also is when we ask people about the tools and technologies that are most useful to them in uh, contributing to the quality of their learning in the MOOCs, uh, connectivist MOOCs, mm -hmm. the daily newsletter will always come up at the top of the list. It's funny eh? because you don't see a daily newsletter in most online courses. So this is the one that keeps coming up. Yeah. We have it as an option for those who have filled our first survey feedback. Yeah. What's the most uh, useful, essential piece of information you've gotten out of the course or the tools, technologies or support that are, are the best uh, is the, the, the daily. Mm -hmm. uh, people really appreciate that one. They appreciate it in this uh, personal learning yeah. MOOC as well. Uh, the other tools is the live uh, uh, recorded session for people who can't participate live here. Yeah. They go back and look at the archive sure. recorded yeah. uh, sessions. So that like, comes out as a... a like we have five viewers many. right now. Well, okay. <laughs> we just lost one. Oh, we're a little delayed <laughs> starting, so maybe yeah. that's a factor too. I oh, we're to... back up to five again. So oh. I don't know if we... Well, that might be me uh, in, might the, be in the other room. Might be logging in and out, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... So, but yeah, I mean, and this is something, this is a factor that goes back as far back as Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo were doing EdTech Talk. And EdTech Talk, as you may recall, was an audio broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, they used, I think it was Shoutcast or whatever. Um, and, but they would have live broadcasts. They'd have guests and listeners but they have recordings as well. And they always said they got many more listeners through their recordings than exactly. they got through their live broadcasts. And, and I'm really hoping that's the case here. Yeah, exactly. And when you remember back in the MOOC, the French MOOC that we offered, yeah. the connectivity was an issue for yeah. people in Africa. Yeah. So at last resort, they would have appreciated having a PDF of some of the, the talks, the transcripts, things yeah. like that. When everything else fails and you don't even have access to video, which is problematic, yeah. and you're offering this live uh, feature, uh, that's when you're doing this yeah. type of demographic across the continents yeah. that you have to consider providing material and, and every or any other format that, that you can. So that was an issue, even they would have accepted a PDF or Word yeah. version of transcripts of your talks, which you do. I've, I've done a bunch of transcripts, and I can, I can tell you from experience that it's about $150 or so an hour to produce a transcript and then of course I have to go over it after mm -hmm. to correct the spelling mistakes yeah. uh, and, and where they got a word wrong but that's not too bad it's pretty quick yeah but but that's what it costs us and of course a lot of our mo MOOCs we ran without really a budget so. exactly exactly so it's all time investment invested as much yeah. for the facilitator as it is for the participants well, yeah. it's your time yeah. so and people may not uh, realize yeah. that yeah. going going in there that this is uh, most of the time is after hours and you're preparing things and yeah. presentations and sometimes doing things on the fly too in between your travels and yeah. so we get to yeah. know where in the world Stephen Dan yeah. is where you're <laughs> presenting and that's another uh, incentive or motivation for people to participate is that mm -hmm. they come to to hear Stephen Downs. Mm -hmm. uh, let's face it, you're you're popular in the area. You have a fair amount of uh, of visibility. Yeah. You're, you're saying so, that we have five viewers. For five <laughs> <laughs> We're not discounting the people that will uh, access the archives yeah, later. Yeah. Our numbers always go up for that. But that's one of the motivations for people to show up to a MOOC is that it's the guest speaker, it's yeah, the facilitator, yeah. and that has uh, some some weight to it. And mm -hmm. obviously, uh, the human in the loop is still very yeah. important. Uh, you can you know automate all you want. But some people will still show up yeah. to hear the speaker. You know, it's funny because, like, I listen to this thing. This is my phone. Uh, I listen to this at night. And I could listen to recorded music, but I don't want to listen to recorded music. I, want, I listen lots to baseball because I like the fact that there is a person speaking to me at that very moment describing something that's happening. Mm -hmm. It matters. It does. It does. So some of the other challenges for us as researchers is trying to get that information, extract uh, the information uh, as the course unfolds. So mm -hmm. it's useful for you as a facilitator to know what people yeah. are having difficulties with. How, like some of the premises of uh, the activities in a MOOC are aggregation, remixing, repurposing, right. feed forward. If people are having a hard time figuring that out, how should I aggregate? How should I bring that information, yeah. the information overload? 
what how how best do do i do i share this information well post share yeah. and put it in the forum provide a link and i think yeah. people uh, catch on to that fairly early and if not they're just uh spectators they yeah. watch the traffic go by they say and they pick up nuggets and gems yeah. of information that that they find useful is that so, enough if they do that do you think for some yeah. if they're self uh directed and uh, they're independent uh some people depending on and we've surveyed people on your their level of comfort yeah. uh in using technologies and being comfortable extracting things and doing things on their own you still have uh, quite a few people uh, that are out of their comfort zone yeah. that need the structure and support from yeah. others to, you know, either uh, share, know what to do with it, mm -hmm. integrate it in their practice. And a lot of people are actually an interesting finding is that they're doing doctoral work right. on the MOOC itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they're getting the experience, they're getting yeah. data out of this, they're getting the experience of how it actually is firsthand to participate in a MOOC. So people are in there for different reasons. Yeah but the connecting to others seems to still be problematic. It feels, in this one again, it feels problematic. I'm, I'm not seeing it. We have the, the discussion forums, but you know, I mean, but they're, they're, they're awkward. They're, well, they're Red X discussion forums, but mm -hmm. we really haven't solved, to my liking anyways, how to mix, you know, the stuff like this, the online stuff, the forums and the interaction. One of the things that uh, people say they like about Futureland, and I had Robert Gregoire in here just the, uh, just a few minutes ago, and he was saying the same sort of thing. Uh, the content, the discussion happens right in the same place, mm -hmm. and you know that's a design challenge, of course. Yeah. But I, I think there's a lot of merit in that approach. Mm -hmm. I want to steal it. <laughs> and you have a lot of people on this course that are thinking of ideas, thinking mm -hmm. how they might uh, make the experience better for themselves and go yeah. out and I actually tweet about it, uh, write a personal blog about it. So yeah. they're generating a lot of uh, ideas as mm -hmm. well. And these are leaders, these are uh, teachers, professors, yeah. you have a, a, a whole uh, segment of professionals out there that, that, that participate and, yeah. and generate ideas and you know very well the MOOC sometimes takes off long after the course has ended. Yeah. Uh, the MOOC continues, the <laughs> yeah. life of the MOOC. So people find use out of the resources that yeah. are actually shared, the links, uh, the readings, um, and the level of sharing artifacts that, that uh, get shared in the various yeah. uh, modes, the mediums, the forums, but people just don't have the capacity to take it all in. They yeah. realize maybe one month later after they go back and revisit. That's why I like the fact that you Mo a lot of times we'll keep the MOOC open. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily close at the, the end date of the... Uh, yeah, and again, the, the newsletter archives and the recordings and all of that will be available. The open edX environment I can't make promises about because that's run by the organization and, you know, we don't know if they'll keep the lights on day to day. <laughs> so, uh, but the stuff that's on downs.ca and the stuff that's posted to YouTube and that will still be around. So. Excellent. We haven't really surveyed people way after the fact. We do communi yeah. communicate with participants during the course, yeah. but we kind of lose track of how what the impact yeah. after the course has ended has, has, has been. But we can tell by pe people's personal blogs that they continue reflecting yeah. about what they've learned, what they've viewed and keep using the material from the course actually. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's funny they don't do course evaluations like five years after the course. Yeah. I, yeah. I could do some really good evaluations like my university courses. I really liked the philosophy of mind course I did with John Baker in oh, what would it be? <laughs> Nineteen ninety three. Great <laughs> course, yeah. great course, and and Verena Hubert Eisen taught me uh, the philosophy of mathematics, and even though I'm not very good at mathematics, now I know why I'm not very good at mathematics. <laughs> I actually do. It's like this whole like one of the things we talked about was like the principle principle of substitutivity. Right? Wow. Can you take an equation and substitute it for a variable? Well, in mathematics, they do that all the time. Me, I was just completely perplexed by the idea. But, and, and it turns out there's a philosophical problem with that, right? 
right? Because an equation isn't a number. Maybe you should, anyhow. So it got you good class. Class. actually yeah. memorable to remember that 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 long. Yeah. You know, the course content, something that gets you uh, yeah. thinking. But so, nobody ever asks this long after. Yeah. yeah. And professors don't realize what no. impact that they have on students that remember a class or a lecture or yeah. a concept that they, uh, you know, inspired someone to go on and make a yeah. career out of. Well, exactly. Yeah. In your case, you know. I remember my grade 12 English teacher. Mm -hmm. Got me doing journaling and blogging, except it wasn't blogging then. Yeah. So, but yeah. yeah. So that's Jamie Bell, by the way. Jamie <laughs> Bell. <laughs> but from my perspective, it's been quite uh, a learning experience as well to see how you operate uh, within these MOOCs mm -hmm. and offer something. This opportunity to people across the world, basically, to connect sure. for free. Uh, openly and to share so it's been fantastic a fantastic source of of, of information and experience from from a researcher standpoint it's been it's been fantastic we've been lucky to be able to do that mm -hmm. so most institutions wouldn't allow us to do that yeah. Yeah. and uh, NRC if they actually knew some of the stuff that we've done probably wouldn't have allowed it either but but they did give us the space and so we were able to offer these courses just open for free uh, you know, don't even have to sign in because we, we didn't actually have to count, you know, how many people we have or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, we ask it in our surveys, you know, what's your motivation for taking the course? And it's just yeah. amazing what people say is the way of the future. Uh, one said, I have no idea, the slightest <laughs> idea how to bring it into the future, yeah. actually. But they know that it's the wave of the future. And mm. it's, well, the future has been going sure, is yeah. now the present so yeah. we used to talk it as a future talk about it as a futuristic type of thing a learning yeah. opportunity open and accessible to anyone anytime while well, you're actually doing it so so what all. are we doing wrong where are we missing the boat uh i it's think okay in, you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> i think the opportunity to actually express it's always good in a course to allow participants to express and comment yeah uh anytime we always get useful feedback just yeah. by creating the, the opportunity and ask uh, you've done it in the course and usually participation will really rise and peak when you ask that question in the forum what are yeah. we doing right what are we doing wrong what, so how maybe can we I should be asking them that. yeah we've done it usually yeah. it comes up around the midway yeah. um, that people are feeling a, a little you know overwhelmed yeah uh, you re reaffirm it and and uh, repeat it that you're not gonna be able to read everything and know everything yeah you know so stop panicking that you have to read everything and know everything so you've repeated it but actually asking people uh, in the form how are you doing in the class mm -hmm. how what can we improve on and people will gladly yeah. uh, respond to that they've responded in um, our, our surveys numerous times uh, more structure nice to have the content uh, <laughs> Be, uh, ahead of time yeah. so just by providing the topics and get people thinking yeah. uh, you know maybe uh, the Friday before the Monday starts that week and you've done it you've actually displayed the course content and the topics yeah. in the reading so people as much as I can and, and we have to keep in mind a lot of this content doesn't exist yet because I'm a... way too disorganized yeah yeah in certain <laughs> MOOCs uh, when we've had uh, guests uh, people appreciated having the readings ahead of time mm -hmm. to be able to ask a question in the yeah. forum where it has become really interactive mm -hmm. where people are chatting and, and asking questions in these live yeah. sessions by the way I don't know if we have questions or <laughs> well <laughs> you away. see the, there's this but I we can pop into the other window and see so why don't we do that because there is the other window uh, let's see if I remember where it is. This is this is it here. So you guys can't see this, but we're popping into the other window. Um, oh, but now I guess I have to click this, don't I? So yeah, but you see, we can't see the questions. Like we don't have don't the usual chart. view. Yeah. You see us speaking in the past. <laughs> Uh, but but well okay so there's nothing there to see but maybe in Twitter so that's I do check Twitter during these webcasts so and uh, yeah okay we got a, a few things etherpad is open source 
Yeah. We are fine, but we are motivated. <laughs> We've Yay. used Naturepad in uh, the, uh, the uh, have, yeah. open educational uh, learning resources MOOC, the yeah. French MOOC, and it's a lot for the facilitator to handle and keep track of as well because it's quite dynamic. Yeah, and uh, there are only win so many windows and and chat areas that Stephen yeah. can can keep track of. That's the other challenge from the facilitator point of view. It is, but we I always. Forget. Yeah, it's a it's a lot to handle. There's a lot of uh, and we've yeah. co-facilitated on on certain occasions when yeah. uh, the demand was there to moderate and, yeah. and uh, with guest speakers. But uh, yeah, generally it's just you know uh, you have the structured versus non-structured structured groups and participants, and yeah. it's always to find the happy medium and yeah. cater to both. And I think you've struck a nice <laughs> balance here with offering. You know, week by week breakdowns cool. and the daily keeps feeding that yeah. information and there's continuity. At least people can rely on on that as a constant sort of source of information. They know what's coming up. They know what's advertised. Yeah. And, um, and I do plan. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to do this, but I do plan to offer this course again, and we'll have the videos and the recordings that we've made from the previous one will be available ahead of time in the new one. So in the new one, there will be more structure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll like that more, but it'll be there. Yeah, and it's always the uh, the toss up between you know offering uh, neat and uh, powerful analytics yeah. with a group of two hundred and some. Uh, you can see in the network who's who's clustering, who's speaking about certain topics yeah. that might be of interest to you. Yeah. So it's always user centered. Yeah. Uh, as to what should I be looking for? What should I be paying attention to? What discussion threads instead of having to go through all the list yeah. of discussion threads? Um, sometimes you want to know exactly what topics is being discussed. I really wish we could just have a window here and a, a real chat there. Yeah. Like not the real Google time. group chat that nobody is using. Because yeah. You know, having a chat with zero comments on it is useful. Yeah, it's always the challenge of integration because yeah. if you offer up different uh, opportunities yeah. to, to chat in another window, of course, people will be using different yeah. things for different reasons, the Twitter feeds and things. Yeah. So there's nothing to integrate all these different areas seamlessly. Yeah. So that's always the challenge. Yeah. And uh, participants are feeling that as well, that there's, there isn't that go-to place. But then if they go to one place, they say, well, that's boring. I'd like to go to maybe more more different places yeah. or to find my own information where I want it. And yeah. that's why people have to kind of remix and, and aggregate and, and uh, do mashups, you know, and, and yeah. pick things that they, they like and combine it in their own personal way, providing they have the, the comfort level and the technology technological skills to well, do. Well, and a lot are not going to. And, and so they'll sort of be, they get whatever they get. Exactly. And we've had lurkers. And some even reacted to the day, resented, they didn't like the term lurking. It's purposeful learning. It's passive learning. Sure. Purposeful, so, purposeful, passive learning. Passive learning. They're PPL. PPL. Exactly. So they say, hey, this is a legitimate of form course it is. of yeah. participation. Yeah. I like to take information in, and there's enough. It's a buffet yeah. of information here. So I take what I need when I need it, and, and some people are fine I with do that. purposeful passive learning with CBC Radio all the time. Okay. Yeah. You kind of listen in when or, you need well, to. Well, you have to like, because they don't let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And it's just perfectly legitimate. Exactly. I love radio. Um, mm -hmm. So. And that's, I, I need to remember to make audio recordings of these talks too, because people have asked for it. Yes, that. podcasts when they're traveling or, so it's yeah. offering up, a, a, you know, different options for different people. Again, yeah. uh, you know, they don't let you talk like about the CBC. We actually allow people to talk and yeah. comment. Uh, you ask them in the forum. If yeah. you ask them a question, how are we doing? If we invite them to a survey, they'll gladly give and let yeah. you know, let us know mm -hmm. how you're doing in the class. Yeah. So. And people who are in the course, and we're up to eight viewers now, uh, which might be a new high for this course. Uh, so uh, you're doing well. Um, but if you want to be on one of these Hangouts, uh, I haven't planned you know, a list of experts ahead of time again because I'm nowhere nearly that organized. Uh, so we'd love to have you on. And uh, you can tell us uh, what is being done right, what's being done wrong, what this course should be about, just send me an email and we'll get you up here. Somehow, if we can make the technology work. Excellent. The other comment that we're getting from yeah. uh, the surveys, uh, 
is a whole issue of uh, credentialing, non-credit credit, credit uh, type yeah, move. Yeah. And there's someone actually said that uh, I'm taking this move to add credibility, credibility sure. to my experience. Yeah. So we actually are are, um, are moving towards another um, survey. Mm -hmm. We're midpoint in the course, so yeah. we'd like to invite uh, participants. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in our last survey. We got great numbers. Yeah. Uh, like. This, Thirty uh, percent. Yeah, I know. I feel rate. depressed about eight or seven eight or viewers, but enough. then the we survey get those numbers up. Thirty <laughs> like percent of the enrollees. Yeah. So our midway uh, uh, survey is a good opportunity again to yeah. solicit to solicit uh, uh, comments and and see how we're doing in the course, yeah. uh, uh, what we can improve on, and as well, uh, you know, the whole issue of uh, credentialing. Mm -hmm. If you're taking this MOOC uh, for uh, professional development, uh, trying to get at why people are taking the MOOC, yeah. uh, does it impact their job, uh, are you, they looking for a promotion, will this MOOC get, uh, help yeah. them get that promotion? So the issue of uh, credentialing uh, and uh, showing evidence uh, of learning, informal learning, this way would be great to get comments on. So I invite everyone when you yeah. you see that, that link to the survey, the mid-course survey, to please uh, help us improve on our research and development. And we're still working on the credentialing for this course, uh, we're in open edX, so there is a credentialing feature in this. I've said in the past that we will use it. Uh, what I didn't say then is we have to figure out how it works, um, but we will between now and the end of the course. So that uh, I think it's tied to the assignments in some way, so we'll have to create an assignment. You do the assignment, you put your X in the box or something, mm -hmm. and then that'll generate the credential for you. And uh, you know, if you've been around this course long enough to see an instruction like put X in the box, you probably deserve the credentials. Okay. And um, we discussed yeah. the uh, badge for course completion. We as well. I think badge, you mentioned yeah. that in one of your yeah. uh, live sessions. So, so I just want to just want to get on top of this and figure out how this works, and, and then we'll implement it. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we're to draw any lessons from the work that we've done in MOOCs, you know, the various MOOCs over the years, including this one, and apply them to personal learning uh, and personal learning environments. What what things should we draw from this experience? One size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. There's so much variability. We've actually surveyed people on their learning styles and mm -hmm. you can't, it's difficult to account for that and have a unified design. You have to have, and we're talking adaptive Mm -hmm. uh, designs, designs on, on the things that change, uh, you know, depending on a person's mood, yeah. uh, you know, daily. I don't want to see that view today, I want to yeah. see this view. So if you uh, try to account for learning styles and learning preferences, and moods and uh, sentiments for that day, you're going to have to have things that you can change mm -hmm. dynamically and on the fly. Yeah. So that from a design pro point of view is, is a huge challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to add yeah. intelligence to that, uh, you know, provide uh, end users with the right feedback at the right time to know exactly what they know and tell them what maybe they should okay. look into and there are gaps in their knowledge, that's where you get into the intelligence type designs. Is there anything and simple we can do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing is simple, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so, it's challenging. Yeah. There's a lot of work being done here at the NRC. Mm -hmm. Uh, automatic competency uh, recognition and, and uh, you know a lot of uh, recommender type research yeah. uh, you know the work being done in LPSS yeah. is, is part of those solutions that we're as working as soon towards. as you said mood the first thing that struck me is okay well we're gonna have to have a camera that looks at you looks at your face determines what mood you're in and changes the background of the you know, to compensate, yeah. Yeah. changes the color, right? you're, you're very angry, let me give you soothing blue. Exactly. <laughs> but then you have people who <laughs> will want that automated and other people will be frustrated by the fact it's being done automatically yeah. and they're not clicking and choosing. And other people want. won't want the camera watching them while they learn because, yeah. They'll feel watched. They'll feel big, watched. Big Brother is because uh, they are being watched. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So you have to decide the fine line between what you want to have in the background, yeah. what prompts and feedback you want people to yeah. actually physically click because you overburden 
uh, learners much like the MOOC with too much information, yeah. too much at once, too much prompting. Yeah. So again, to find that that the, that right balance in the design of uh, the, in the new e-learning ecosystem yeah. that they, they call. Yeah, because you, you want you want the MOOC to be as personally configured as possible, but without them having to change anything. Mm -hmm. Because every time they have to twiddle a command or make a, you know, check a checkbox or whatever, that's overhead. Yeah, just having you people know. fill out profiles yeah. when they enter a course and yeah. what they like, their previous experience. You know, if you ask more than five, six questions, seven questions, people feel overburdened by just the amount yeah. of information that's uh, being asked to, uh, you know, yeah. adapt and modify an environment to fit to suit their their preferences. So. Again, how do you do it? How do you do it in a smart way? Uh, is is a challenge. Yeah. a challenge, and not just environment ultimately, because it's content, it's interactivity. It's you know, some people want more interactivity, others not so much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that kind of takes us to close to top of the hour. Um, I'm going to pop back into Twitter ever so briefly before we go, but I have an airplane I'm going to have to catch, so we, we can't go long. But let's take a look at see if anything else has happened in Twitter. And, well, I just have to reload. Let's see. And I'm, I'm thinking nothing else happened in Twitter, but I could be wrong. Uh, and, uh, yes, I am wrong. So, uh, cohort. So this is Naomi saying, and Naomi, we're glad you made it into the into the course here because we saw the your earlier tweet saying, uh, "I'm wondering where the link is." And so, welcome. <laughs> um, so, cohorts. So we have Matteo saying, uh, "Cohorts of students have different levels of engagement too, so they make or break the course." Yeah. I, and I always have mixed feelings about cohorts um, because, you know, I mean, cohort is a group of people following a course. And, you know, anytime you're with a group of people, there's people who want to go too far ahead, people who are lagging behind, mm -hmm. people who want to explore the side path. And, and I, I think this is touching on that. So Naomi is responding, yes, and cohorts also seem unpredictable with parallel groups showing varying degrees of, invo of involvement. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you were to categorize people when we, like we've tried to say, okay, what are your, is your competency level, your technical skills, high, medium, low type of thing. Uh, we've never mm. boxed people in because no. people's levels and comfort will change even throughout the eight weeks. Of yeah. course, they'll become quickly become an expert yeah. in what they're doing. So, we haven't worked with uh, control groups and experimental type uh, yeah. things, you know, to see how much learning, how much technical, uh, how many technical oh, skills are actually. Do that? How I, that? <laughs> oh. I have a few ideas, but I, I don't know. Yeah, it goes against the philosophy of of the MOOC as open yeah. and. You know, well, I like I like the idea of the MOOC as open, um, but I also like the idea of people forming their own groups if they wish. But of course, you know, even in a room, this happens. Jay. You tell people form your own groups, and they mill around the room, looking yeah. lost. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they finally do form groups, and then there's always two or three people who aren't in any of the groups. Yeah. I know because I was one of those two or three people. Um, and to lock people in based on what they've checked off early on in the course, yeah. that may change. That uh, will change. They may yeah. not want to self-identify as a low technical yeah, you know, uh, yeah so i mean yeah. you have to give people uh, the opportunity to yeah. to find their way so and also too when when people form groups you know like you know it's just like in networks right like affiliates with like and so you you, you get homogenous groups which is not good because you know learning and engagement these things are, are stimulated more by diversity. Mm -hmm. So you want to get people who would not normally group with each other into groups, but they would not normally do this because they don't like it. Yeah. Well, so, the nice thing about MOOCs is, is you see in the discussions, the threads, some person might be a subject matter expert, but mm -hmm. low on the technical side. So yeah. you do have that, uh, 
that distribution within the various groups of clusters that will yeah. form with people with different abilities, skill sets, mm -hmm. and experience. Yeah. So, and that's mm -hmm. we want that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anything else here in the, in the Twitter? Uh, one last reload. So they're eight, but they're motivated now. <laughs> so, no, I think that's it for now. I see the different oh. modalities is fine. Oh. Like, and it's messiness and complexity. Yes. The yeah. stuff that researchers really love, the messiness and complexity that we like to... Uh, I'm good with messiness and complexity, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, but a lot of participants aren't. We want... We want the messiness and complexity, but we don't want it to feel messy and complex to the person taking the course. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the power grid, right? The, the power grid is messy and complex, way messier and complex than you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. But if you want power for your computer, you just plug it in the wall and it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you the unit, that. the important basic unit is the person at the center of yeah. it all. If they feel uh, you know, disorganized and can't find the information that they're looking for, well, that's yeah. problematic. That's, you know, if the yeah. overall picture looks a little messy and, you that's know, fine. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But, so yeah. every person needs to be able to find their way. And uh, so that's the. Uh, so the getting the person there. right is the key thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. User centered design and, yeah. and adapting to the needs of the individual. And we've, we've uh, surveyed people on that constantly. Mm -hmm. How do you find that right balance? And people have weighed in, They've, yeah. uh, but in terms of mm, technologies to integrate everything in one, that's you know across platforms, across yeah. the tools and modalities in one area. We're always branching out, even in these MOOCs, we go out of the course, and yeah. it is. But that's that's the interesting thing about the course. It, it also it's the impact of the course yeah. keeps going on on so far away from the nucleus, yeah. you know off on Twitter, people are retweeting about it, that may not even be in the yeah. course. So do we want to con curtail and control that? No, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I, I think it's cool that people who aren't even in the course have an experience of the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think that's good. And they're talking about it, yeah. yeah. All right, so that takes us to 1 o'clock. So we're going to wrap it up here, otherwise I'll miss my flight. Um, and nobody wants that. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Stephen, for the opportunity. It's my share pleasure. So I'm Stephen Downs again, and again, Helen Fournier of the National Research Council uh, Learning and Performance Support Systems Program, and we're located today in Moncton. Our next hangout will be at 12 noon Eastern or 9 a.m. Pacific time, and I'll be on the coast in San Diego. Um, I've got a talk that I'm giving there on Saturday, but our MOOC hangout will be on Friday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And uh, we'll be talking about models of personal learning environments and, and the history of the personal learning environment as it's developed sort of alongside but as you know the, the the poorer cousin to MOOCs over the last seven years or so so we'll see you then bye everyone